everybody. Um, I think we can get this webinar started. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Sue Yu. My pronouns are they, them. Welcome to the Advancing Gender Equality, a conversation on ending poverty for people with a disabilities webinar. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm the interim manager of community outreach at West Coast Leaf, and I'm also a first generation <laughs> settler with ancestry um, in Han Chinese from the Guangdong and Guizhou provinces of China. I'm living and joining today from the traditional unsurrendered and stolen homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sable Tooth Nations. And West Coast Leaf's office is also located on these um, traditional ancestral and unceded Coast Salish homelands. Um, West Coast Leaf is a settler nonprofit and we're mandated to utilize colonial legal strategies within a colonial legal system. And similarly, the gender equality report card, which we'll be using as kind of uh, to talk about today, assesses the government of BC's track record on gender justice and therefore also grades a colonial and illegitimate government. Indigenous women, trans, non-binary, and two-spirit people who are disabled are very disproportionately targeted, oppressed, and regulated by colonialism in both economic security and healthcare, the two issues that are explored in the report card. Um, in making this acknowledgement today, my attention is to acknowledge and clearly name the realities that these land belong to Indigenous peoples and that my life here benefits um, and life here and the benefits I experience living here are tied to the colonial theft and dispossession of indigenous peoples from their lands and their waters. And I invite everyone to use the chat to introduce themselves and the organizations that you're attending from, if any, and also type um, a land acknowledgement of where you're joining from. So this webinar was developed in collaboration with Disability Without Poverty and Plan Institute with the goal of discussing the intersectional experiences of people with disabilities. And I wanna express my fullest gratitude towards Liz from Plan Institute and Amy and Michelle from Disability Without Poverty. Um, and so yeah, now I'll pass to Michelle to introduce the accessibility for this webinar. Good morning, everybody. Um, I I'm coming to you from Kelowna, BC, which is the on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Okanagan Silks First Nations, whose lands I am very grateful to uh, live here as an uninvited settler. I um, my my role currently is to go over the accessibility options for this webinar because it's something that um, that we do quite frequently at Disability Without Poverty. And um, I will be passing on to Betty, who will be leading you through the report card. And then, you know, when her and I chat, uh, for those of you who don't already know me, we will uh, we'll get to know each other a little better. So please note that during presentations and panel discussions, we will have the chat closed to the public as it can be disruptive to other participants. If you experience technical difficulties, we will be able to send a chat message to the hosts and panel. I'm sorry, you will be able to send a chat message to the hosts and panelists. For all questions that you have for the panelists, please put these in the Q&A which is usually a box at the bottom of your screen. We'd greatly encourage you to share your questions today as we'll be responding to as many as we can live during the conversation. Our meeting today features ASL interpretation and English captioning. Please take a moment to adjust your settings as appropriate. For those who require ASL interpretation, we will be spotlighting the interpreters throughout the presentation. We will keep the participant meeting view as speaker view so you can always see these on your screen. To enable captions, select the captions option on your Zoom menu. If you'd like to adjust the size and placement of these captions, you'll need to go into your Zoom accessibility settings. If we can support you through this presentation, please send us a message in the chat box and someone will assist you. For any additional settings, please go to your personal Zoom account settings or your in-webinar audio settings for more customization. And finally, please make sure to share your questions in the Q&A box 
because otherwise Betty and I will be coming up with questions for ourselves. So we really need to hear from you. Our team members from Plan Institute are specialists at this. And along with Sue Yu, I reach out with my thanks to them for their support in webinars that we've done with them previously and particularly this one today. They are on hand to help you with any technical difficulties you may be experiencing. And with that, I'm going to pass over to Betty. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, everyone here. Um, I am Betty. I'm a staff lawyer at West Coast Beef. Um, my pronouns are she and her. And I'm joining from the office today. So um, I'm joining you from the stolen, unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, like Michelle mentioned, the, force, the first portion of today's webinar is going to be um, a presentation providing a brief overview of the report card. So I'm expecting to take 10 minutes. Um, I will now share my screen uh, with PowerPoint um, slides for the presentation um, just to get us started. Please let me know if you're unable to, to see anything. Okay, hearing no concerns, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, so the BC um, gender report card, um, the 2021 report card is um, a deep dive into two topics, economic security and healthcare. And in doing so, we partnered with um, Anya, the Urban Native Youth Association, our community partners, Urban Native Youth Association, um, Pace Society, and Snow, um, and also had dialogues with more than with more than forty community with more than thirty community partners, um, who provided invaluable insights, um, as well as staff and students who provided uh, research and writing. Um, so, a couple of things to note here in each section. Um, Altogether, we graded 13 issues and we use the terms action, promised action, inaction, and uh, I think harmful action to describe our findings. Um, the most of the terms I think are self-explanatory, but with regards to promised action, we use that to refer to BC's commitments or um, funding allocations where um, it's not yeah, it's too early to tell if there's been if, there, if it will deliver meaningful change. Um, another thing to note with the report card is that higher grades don't necessarily indicate um, perfect alignment by the government with human rights standards or that people's needs are being fully met, but rather there's been considerable meaningful action in that um, area. So our goals for the report card were to hold the BC government accountable to its international uh, obligations, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, and other legal instruments, such as the Yoga Carta principles, um, which relate to sexual orientation and gender identity, to ensure that uh, our uh, advancement of gender equality is inclusive and expansive. Um, other goals include holding the BC government accountable to um, community visions for well-being, um, as well as creating a foundation for research and advocacy. And so for the next part, it's just going to be a brief run through of the two big um, areas, economic security and healthcare. Um, however, because of the time, I won't be able to get to each of the issue areas. So I'm going to pick um, a couple that are relevant to today's discussion from each section. Uh, and then some of the other pieces we'll get to in the conversation with Michelle. Um, so for economic security, the first piece is going to be social services, um, which got a grade of, uh, which was graded a C. Um, and one of the key takeaways here is that um, people are facing discrimination and barriers in trying to access services um, and having to prove or justify their care needs. Um, however, there has been some progress by the government, such as uh, 
commitment to provide funding to Community Living BC in 2021, um, as well as in 2022, the government expanded the Accessible British Columbia Act to more uh, public sector organizations. Um, however, um, disability activists and organizations such as Disability Alliance BC have called this act um, and have critiqued this act for the lack of timelines, um, the definitions of um, impairment that aren't very inclusive and are narrow, um, and other critiques as well. So that's why um, there's a grade of C here. Um, another section here is child care under economic security. And child care is actually one of the two higher grades or one of the few higher grades on in the report card with a grade of B. Um, because there have been some meaningful actions taken in this area um, with the um, taller $10 a day spaces, um, as well as significant cuts that have been made to child care costs for families. Um, however, there's still room for improvement. For example, um, in uh, making progress for by having uh, resources and training available for early child care educators to ensure that um, these spaces are inclusive and the diverse needs of families are being met. And as you can see, this here is a quote from a community dialogue participant um, about that need for, for support for um, children with special needs uh, and other families. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides. Okay, so uh, second area, healthcare. Um, and uh, again, under this uh, area, we covered seven issues and we graded all of them. And um, I think the two sections relevant here is going to be accessibility of healthcare, um, which was graded C. Um, that shows that some modest action has been taken, but not sufficient. Um, there wasn't a lot of high grades, to be honest, in, in the report card. And here we focused on primary care, um, acute care, and access to surgeries. Um, and although the government has made some funding and has made some progress, it follows years of uh, underfunding and years of uh, shortages like staff shortages. Um, for example, during the first year of the pandemic, more than 40% of people in British Columbia had trouble accessing healthcare services, um, which is problematic for a number of reasons, including uh, because of how ongoing care relationship is important for people who experience chronic illnesses or um, survivors of sexual violence. Um, so one of the community dialogue participants in the context of sexual violence described their experience of having to go uh, to an emergency room for care because there wasn't any care available within the community setting. Um, and this is especially problematic considering the fact that um, Indigenous women, um, people of color, 2S LGBTQ plus folks and people with disabilities are disproportionately impacted by um, sexual violence. There is um, also a geographic dimension to the accessibility concerns in our findings. Um, so for example, um, in the North, people are having to forgo their care needs or having to expend a lot of time and resources um, to meet with healthcare providers. Um, so that is another area of uh, improvement. For, for BC. And I'm going to end it here on mental health care, um, which was graded C as you can see here. Um, so in 2021, the BC government uh, announced a lot of investments in this area. However, we've heard from community that these investments have not materialized. Um, so that's a concern. Um, so that's like a as you can see from the quote, it's uh, from a community dialogue participant saying, where are the mental health services? Where is the promised um, services? Um, additionally, um, the, there has been critiques of the Mental Health Act um, by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, 
because of um, the involuntary uh, treatment is very broad, as well as the connected force treatment, treatment issues. Um, as you can see from the table here or, or from the graph here, there's more involuntary uh, care than voluntary care under the Act. Um, and again, this is concerning, but also more so concerning because of other reports, such as the one from the BC Ombudsperson uh, about how the human rights of people in care under the Act is not being respected. Uh, for example, um, not all of the legal um, forms that are required to be filled out are filled out. Um, so this concern has been raised uh, by the BC Ombudsperson. Um, so yeah, these are some of our findings that um, relate to uh, our conversation today. However, it's not everything. Um, so it's just a very brief highlight. Um, I think we can provide a link to a report card if we haven't yet already. So take a look. Um, even just the executive summary has a lot of information. Um, but I'm going to stop here with the overview and stop showing my screen and we can transition to the conversation portion of this webinar. Thank you, Betty, very much for that overview. It, uh, as we prepare to chat, it, it really helps me to focus the things that we're, we're ready to talk about. Yeah, no worries. And so um, there's a few areas for discussion that we have prepared today. Um, so one of it is, is disability and income. Um, and I think um, we should start this conversation by discussing the PWD rates in general and how low it, low it is. Um, there were some increases to the rate in 2021, a $175 increase per month. Um, however, it's um, less than $300 recommended by advocates in the BC income, basic income panel. Um, and there were no additions to the rate made in budget 2022. Um, and it's not just the minimal amount of rate that's concerning. There's also, you know, other issues surrounding it, such as the spousal cap um, and administrative barriers to accessing it. Um, so, Michelle, do you do you have any uh, thoughts to add here? Sure. I mean, this is uh, for us at Disability Without Poverty. This is our, um, you know, main concerns, um, not just in BC but across the country that the, the rates that people receive for disability assistance are so far below the poverty line that it creates a situation that, that lives are simply untenable the way it's set up. So, you know, we know in BC that the amount is $1,428.50 now with this in recent increase. Um, currently, the poverty line in Vancouver is just over $2,100, just over $2,100. So the PWD rate, as we, as we colloquially call it here, is only two thirds of the poverty line. And we also know that it costs much more to be disabled at, when you reach the level of disability where you are typically eligible for something like PWD than it does not to be disabled. Um, often it's, I've, there isn't good Canadian data on this, never mind BC data, but from comparable um, jurisdictions like the UK, Ireland, Australia, that amount is often seen as 40%. So that means that that $1,400 is, it comes out at half the poverty line or less. So we're creating this uh, this legislated poverty um, that's that's simply untenable. The one thing I can say that um, you know, with our work, when we look at things across the country, the one area that BC has uh, has has really um, changed is that it opened up the way that people can earn more money into being something that is measured annually rather than monthly. And when that happened, the government found that for all the number of people that claimed was had a slight increase, the hours that those who could work 
trebled because you know we know that people particularly when he talks about mental health betty people with uh, episodic illness um, disabilities and illnesses um that there are times when they can earn or even certain times of the year maybe you know they're able to function better in warmer months or not in the summer heat or whatever that may be and with a monthly cap it meant that those people were being held back in those months but um but they with a with an annual cap which is certainly something we don't see replicated across the country it means that they can earn more but that's really kind of small peanuts compared to, you know, the actual amounts. Um, I think that, you know, when we talk about increases, um, many jurisdictions, BC being one of them, doesn't link their PWD to inflation. So every increase is something that is, it, it's almost felt that it's been given as by this sort of you know benevolent government and that people have to go cap in hand for and it's so belittling it's so belittling to dignity and uh, you know to be able to live with dignity autonomy and independence when every every uh, increase is, is is has to be championed as a win by the government but these are people like people's lives we're talking about and as i said that amount is so far below the poverty line it um, that nobody should be feeling particularly proud of themselves over it. Back to you, Betty. Thank you. I think those are really good points. I um, I think not only is it not tied to inflation, but it's not even necessarily that they're. I'll try to speak slower. I feel like I saw in the comments that it, um, I made a note to myself, and then I forgot that I made a note to myself. But um, so. Yes, so not only is it not tied to inflation, but it's not like the government makes these increases every year either, or that these increases are very significant for those times that they do, um, which they should be to make up for those times when, you know, there hasn't been, and like the rate has remained stagnant. Um, and I think it's also important that note that you made about um, the flexibility in the workplace. Um, so if someone, you know, can't work, um, you know, the same for how a lot of people might work that like nine to five or like that set, like Monday to like, you know, 24 hour shifts or whatever that might look like, um, or, you know, they might have a chronic illness that means that, um, that they can't perform for longer periods of time. Um, but then a lot of the times these things are tied to um, compensation um, or they're tied to the um, progress that you make in your career. So I think that's an important thing to think about as to how um, employers um, are able to be flexible with, it, with their employees. So for example, with COVID-19, we saw how a lot of um, people were able to sort of transition to working from home. Um, obviously not everyone, uh, not people um, who are working precarious jobs, which we will get to uh, in a minute. So I think that was an important piece. But in addition to the rates, like I mentioned earlier, there's also policies that the government can change. For example, the spousal cap. Um, so because the spousal cap uh, causes financial dependence on one partner, um, so if you're receiving PWD rates and assistance and your partner isn't, um, there's a little bit of a clawback. Um, and this is paternalistic and assuming that, you know, uh, the people with disabilities need to be taken care of by their partner as opposed to having their, their own income. Um, again, especially in light of the low rates. Um, so... I don't know. I remember, Michelle, you had a conversation about this, about an experience from a member in Quebec if you wanted to share. Yeah, I yeah, I have many thoughts on, on this. I, I know for us at Disability Without Poverty, as we, and we're going to talk about a little bit later, as we work towards this federal Canada disability benefit, um, one of the things that we we really have as our one of our, our principles for that is that this become an individualized benefit and the hope would be 
that we could then use that as leverage to trickle down to the provinces. Um, you know, I I hear many comments. Our um, the bill is currently going through the Senate, and when Disability Without Poverty presented to the Senate's committee, social, social, technical, something it's called. It's their standing committee that these types of bills go through. One of the people from our leadership team in Quebec, um, who is a young woman in her 20s, who is somebody who is disabled and lives in poverty, said to the committee that, you know, that she is not able to live with her partner because of his income and because of the effect that that has on his life uh, on, on their joint income it would reduce it to such an extent that they wouldn't be able to live on it because it takes it down to less than the sum of these two small parts you know and i hear stories um in bc from people who choose not to live together right so this is like a it's like the tax on love in that you're not allowed to be together with your partner because not only do you lose financially, but you lose in very important services like care. I can speak from a you know a personal standpoint that my husband and I are both disabled and, and both receive care and it has to be done separately. And when I was asked when I asked why that would be the case. I was told because it will be easier when one of you dies because built into our systems is that is that medical model that disabled people live extremely vulnerable lives. And we're all about to use an English phrase to pop our clogs any minute. And the you know, the disgust I feel when when we're treated in those ways. Um, one of the things that's really important, though, as we look at, you know, this through uh, West Coast Leaf's um, gendered lens that they brought to the report card. Just yesterday, I had a campaign that started through the, the Greater Vancouver YWCA, and it's to do with concussion. And there is a PSA, and I don't have the link. If somebody else could, uh, I'm not. I, I I have it, but I'm not able to um, to be able to put it in the chat box. I'm afraid my uh, my my disability doesn't allow me to be that nimble. Um, but if somebody wants to Google it, it's under concussion, and there is a very striking PSA um, that goes along with it, and it talks about for every one NHLer that gets a concussion, 7,000 women receive a concussion through violence in the home. And that leads to acquired brain injury and the ongoing disabilities of that, and very much an invisible and episodic um, illness. And as, as some, you know, as if, if somebody's in that situation, disabled, not able to earn their own income, this spousal cap is in place, they often find themselves trapped in these extremely dangerous situations. So for so many reasons, that spousal cap is uh, is such a damage. Oh, I can, I can just see at the bottom of the screen list that you've put it in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, that spousal cap is not something that's, that's, you know, I mean, it's bad enough that it's punitive and against people, humans, human rights. It's downright dangerous. It puts people's lives at risk. So, yes, very firmly, um, Betty, that's something that, you know, I, I in in the midst of a load of things that we all feel passionate about here. I think that's one that I feel particularly passionate about that uh, is, is uh, you know, really doesn't allow people to live with dignity and autonomy. Absolutely. Um, and also how it, like you said, it. It, along with other circumstances, such as like how expensive housing is or like the lack of insufficient uh, transition housing for women or other people mentalized because of their gender trying to flee violence, like there's not enough spaces. So all of these factors combine together to um, increase the risk. So in addition to it being the spousal cap being problematic by itself, it forms uh, a part of other uh, pieces of the puzzle that uh, make life difficult for 
and people who experience violence and then intersections like people who experience violence and people with disabilities and and other intersectional identities as well um yeah 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 i think i think um you know any discussion that doesn't involve a talk about the spaces that that we live in i think is um you know uh um is is missing an, a crucial part of of that intersectional piece because uh, the safety right and i know you and i in our notes we have to talk about housing a little later on but when we see you know our unhoused population and again when we talk about um you know brain injury we know that the people um on the downtown east side um, a massive proportion, I know it's more than half of people already had an acquired brain injury before they became unhoused and, and moved onto the streets there. So, you know, when you when you think about those concussions, when you think about where they stem from, um, when you put that disability piece together um, with the unsafe, and, and those are the choices that people are left to make, it's, you know, it's no wonder that your report card looks the way it does. And I think it also um, puts blame on individuals for structural issues. I think the language that you used at the beginning, Michelle, of legislating poverty, um, that this is a choice that you see government and just maybe federally the Canadian government or and other governments are making when they refuse to address uh, poverty um, is important. It's there. That's where the blame should lie and and not on on individuals um and i think a couple of more pieces that i wanted to add about um the rates before we move along is um from the report card is about how you know some of the ways that um the government says they're making progress you know as part of that like pat on the back is like those one-time credits um like the climate action tax credit um or other credits like that and um, you know, advocates and people and allies have, and organizations have asked for, again, raised, raising the rates, um, making such type of increases permanent as opposed to um, one off, uh, like one off increases or like one off uh, payments. Um, and I think this ties back to the dignity aspect um, of when we, when the government was providing serve, it recognized that this was like the minimum amount, right? And as you mentioned, the current rates are lower than poverty rates, but they're also lower than um, the serve amounts um, that were provided during the pandemic. So, um, I think there's a lot more ways to go. Uh, yeah. I think it also keys into that piece of of uh, how people are able to access benefits, right? And um, you know, I know that um, from from my links with Dis DABC Disability Alliance BC that when the government made it, the federal government made its one payment of six hundred dollars to disabled people, um, the 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 ways that they used the disability tax credit for example is a is a benefit that that isn't really that accessible to people who live in poverty because they would typically not apply for it because it's a tax credit you have to pay taxes so now the most vulnerable people are finding it you know something that they struggled to apply for be before they're now feeling that they that they have to apply for to get this one-off payment of 600 bucks, the only thing that we saw, because payments during things for CERB fail to recognize that, that disabled people had less capacity to work hours or to earn that minimum, you know, five grand that you needed to be able to enter into CERB. So, you know, um, jobs were being cut, um, accessibility to places, you know, and spaces was was massively cut because we were locked down at home and disabled people were cut from the ability to access the the this it's becoming this like mythical two thousand dollars. And you know, I see in the news yesterday 
that the government is still going after the people who were able to get Serb and those sorts of things. You know, at, at some point, um, Dr. Lindsay Ted's at the University of Calgary has 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 told who was on the BC Basic Income panel has told me that it it costs more money to chase down the minimal amount of benefit fraud that we have than it would do to just pay the fraud, right? That we live in a society that believes that those who are most vulnerable are somehow out to play the system and that we must chase them down. And that it's not that we examine why, if there are people who play the system, why that thought would be there, why they feel the need to do that. It's certainly not because somebody thinks, gee, I really want to live on $1,400 a month, right? If you have the capacity to earn more than that, well, you know, people people really do, right? Um, you know, and so there's nobody that's saying by choice, I want, I, geez, I really would like to be that person on $1,428.50 a month, right? So I think when we look at, when we put all of that together and not even, you know, when we think of the hoops that people have to jump through to apply that have to say that they're disabled over and over again and, and you know, be able to go for medical appointments that they can't afford to get forms signed um, in a, in a you know, I'm on a, a, you know, bit of a rant here, as you can tell, in a province where we have a million people that don't have a family doctor, and you often need a form that's filled in by somebody who knows your medical history to be able to access these systems, because the system doesn't believe that you're disabled until we go back to that medical model to prove that you're disabled again. So we have so far to go in trying to recognise people's, uh, you know, personal dignity as as disabled people accessing these systems that that we're talking about here yes no worries go on a rant anytime you want um as you <laughs> um we're talking i was write, writing in my notes about yeah um that requirement to get um you know signatures from from doctors or healthcare professionals when like you said there's uh, a shortage of 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 um of like doctors, um, and um, is like another administrative barrier, another um, source of um, stigma, and just not empowering, uh, you know, and it shows disregard. For example, um, one of the uh, harmful actions that the government took over the report card 2021-2022 was um, eliminating a program that they initiated during COVID, which was allowing people on uh, PWD or income assistance to collect EI benefits. Um, so not only did they do that, but uh, some recipients also claimed that the government did not give them enough notice. Uh, so they were not notified sufficiently ahead of time to prepare for this. So it touches on to your comment about like having to chase people to get back that uh, minimal amount um, and not thinking about um, why people would do this. And it's not, and, and that turning happened. back to themselves. Sorry, go ahead. And that happened in January, right? So people had just got through the Christmas period, which, you know, for whatever is, is more expensive, right? Let's, you know, because um, in, in, in any manner, but it's also colder and all of those things, right? It's, it's winter. And for people to have that money to all of a sudden for a check that you're expecting, just not to exist and you know in january right i mean bad in any month but like what a way to start the year right there's there um there's no reason why our systems can't have heart as well right there's no there's no reasons why they the 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 we perhaps we're getting to that but they're not quite yet designed by ai right they're, they're not quite yet designed by artificial intelligence they are actually designed by people and you know and 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 i i know that we will hear that you know we hear often that people um you know it's taxpayers money and we we need to be responsible for the public purse and all of those sorts of things well as a as a civil society we need to be responsible for each other right we need to be we live in an affluent country we can afford these things 
and uh, you know I, I i just i just find that the the heart that is missing is 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 part of the the sort of criminality of this to me right is that the people who are most vulnerable um i was I, I was asked by somebody um whether i thought that uh, that there should be restrictions on what people who receive benefits should be able to spend them on. And of course, my response was, well, when there's restrictions on what the 1% can spend their money on, perhaps then we could talk about what the most vulnerable people in our country get to spend the money that they're able to access on. So, you know, that's that, 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 you know, I, without betraying my political bent that neoliberal underpinning of 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 how our our systems work for the most vulnerable people is just something that that is unconscionable yeah and i think to your point it's also um we're asking the government for for like to meet international legal standards or international human rights principles it's it's you know it's sort of like we're asking the government to meet that bare minimum it's not anything extravagant is is you and other allies are, are advocating for all of these pieces including an increasing care rates it's like you said it's way below the poverty line um way below that serve number that was thrown out that of course a lot of people um who uh maybe weren't in the workforce or were doing criminalized work weren't able to access like such as sex workers uh, you know so it's um yeah it's it's I think we and the report card chat try to connect it back to how there's these legal standards like the Convention on the People, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, um, you know, CEDAW, um, UNDRIP, like all of these legal principles that have minimum standards that the government of Canada has um, ratified with. But although the report card is focused in BC, um, a lot of these areas like BC, like because of federalism, like that's where um, like healthcare, it's up to BC or like this these services that the BC government is providing and therefore should also have to meet this minimum um, standards. And I think another piece we have to talk about here that we've touched on a bit is housing. Um, I don't think we can talk about poverty um, without talking about housing, especially here in BC, um, how expensive it is, how about the lack of affordable housing, and also the shelter allowance, which is uh, for one person, $375 a month. Um, in it, w it went, yes, it got the increase. So it went to $500 a month. So it went up by 125 bucks to, to 500 total, which is what put our, uh, PWD total to 1428 you know and it, again it goes back to what I was talking about before is that a $125 um, increase sounds on its own like wow that there was this increase right by a, a, a massive amount of money but it's on the back of years of lack of increases it's on the back of um, I think it was 10 years that PWD was static and, um, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the um, I, I, I noticed my eyes have flicked to one of the questions from from Shelley, who is, you know, is in in New Brunswick. And, um, you know, for all our situation in B.C. is appalling in New Brunswick, people with disabilities get seven hundred and eighty six dollars and, you know, they have a similar um, rent situation to us of well um, I guess the average rent I don't even know what it is in Vancouver I know for a one-bedroom unit in here in in Kelowna it's fifteen hundred dollars it's more than the entire payment well it's more than double their payment right and so that the fact that a shelter allowance of five hundred dollars is 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 just you know headline hundred and twenty five dollar increase reality which brings something to five hundred dollars, it's just you, 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 you can't buy some, you can't buy housing for five hundred dollars. So you know, I think um, one of the sad things that I find is that at DWP, when we look across the country, is that the situation is equally appalling, and in some cases, 
you know, as I, as I, uh, Shelley, uh, you know, uh, who is, is here, um, I, her province is, uh, is, is, is the lowest of those PWD style payments. They, in fact, it isn't even in a disability uh, um, allowance payment. It's, they don't, maritime provinces don't have disability payments. And so, you know, which almost makes you think the next sentence is so we should be grateful no we should not because the situation that people live in here is appalling and theirs is more appalling right um and so i i do i do find um you know again it goes back to everything we said before about safe spaces however i do want to give a shout out to to one program that uh I, I know of in Vancouver that I think is a glimmer of light across the country. So those of you who don't know of it, the Right Fit program has worked together and it's come through a, a number of groups and I don't really want to name them because I know I'll forget somebody, but DA, um, DABC and BCANS and the um, IFRC, individualized funding resource center and uh, and i'm sure i've missed somebody have come together and worked with uh, metro vancouver um, councils and private landlords to pull accessible housing out of the social housing and private market because what was happening is you know you have a waiting list of people for housing and you have housing that becomes available and if a piece of accessible housing is available, it was just going to that first person on the list, whether they had accessible needs or not. So it meant that then, you know, say those people live in that housing for another 5, 10, 15 years, whatever it may be. It means that that, you know, place with whatever accessibility needs had been built into it was taken out of the market away from people with disabilities who had those specific needs so you know and then what would happen is they would come to the top of the list they would be offered housing that wasn't accessible to them and because they rejected it would go back down the list again and so it was just this awful situation of of some kind of go fish game of something with awful awful repercussions however what's happened is all of that accessible housing has been moved into a separate program and I, I, I find great encouragement with that and it's something that uh, you know the organizations that worked on it and the cities themselves who were able to say you know what we're going to make this move should be extremely proud of and I hope it gets rolled out across the country. I was on a, a talk with the federal housing deputy minister and it was to do with the budget and it was to do with what do we need to spend our money on and all of the um all of the social organizations that were involved all of the non-profits said it's not necessarily spending new money because you know people were talking about permits have to be done more quickly and this that and the other to build new it's it's looking at what we currently have and doing things differently, you know, making sure that housing that is in the right places, so that is um, is a is for people that you know, um, women with children and people with disabilities that need to be close to resources. Making sure that that is accessible and affordable, rather than just the new bright shiny thing going into the downtown whatevers that prices out of the market um those who need to be close to each other and services and be able to afford it the most so you know i i think you talked about before about all of these complex pieces that go into this and i think that housing is a good example of of where it's it's not necessarily like money that needs to be spent it's it's will to achieve something. It's um, you know pulling together to um, on all sides of the table to achieve the right outcomes for people to actually look at the situation and say you know what we can solve this if we're prepared to put aside various pre 
preconceived notions and grandfathered, grandparented in um, situations and beliefs and so on about accessibility and affordability. So, yeah, I'll pass it back to you because it's complex. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to add a couple more points on housing before we move on. Yeah. Um, so in the report card, there's like a graphic about how um, there's like one in 1,000 units that are affordable to housing to households earning under $25,000. So I think it's, you're right, it's not just about increasing the shelter allowance rates, but also, um, and I think the CCPA BC has done a lot of work on this, but increasing the supply of non-market housing. Uh, uh, so people aren't competing, like they're not, folks aren't competing for market housing, which there is a shortage of as well. Um, but I think if it's increasing the allowance only, it might, you know, drive up the price even more, but sort of like on that supply side of housing, maybe there might be more um, meaningful change. And something else, you know, that we found through the work of the report card, um, and I'm sure your work as well, Michelle, is about, as it relates to housing, is about discrimination. Uh, with, with landlords discriminating against um, like different folks, for example, single mothers or um, indigenous people or people on income assistance. Um, so, you know, that's another area where um, this can result in, in poverty or increased yeah. poverty. Discriminating um, against people from the place that they receive the money to be able to pay for the rent right which is you know which are all of the intersectional pieces that you spoke to um rates and single mothers and so on all follow into the places that those people may be able to access funds to be able to pay that rent i just i just want to oh i see uh, i i see that uh, um that Liz is answering Suzanne, who is asking if the right fit is unique to BC. Not only is it unique, I think, I mean, and I perhaps I'm just too proud of the work that the people that did to achieve it. I think it's it's unique to Vancouver. Like we don't have it in Kelowna. Um, it's not elsewhere. I don't think you know. It's not in Victoria. It's a it's a Metro Vancouver program, and I, I think that that's that's something that. Uh, um, you know, people who may be listening to this call, you you know, Google the right fit. And if you're in other if you're in other cities or, you know, across the province and across the country, I strongly advise you having a good look at, at, at that, because I think it makes a major difference to people with disabilities. Where do you want to go to next, Betty? I'm um, not sure. So we scheduled this for um, 11. Right. And then we're going to go to questions. Yeah. So yeah. we can do, I don't know, do you want to maybe have a conversation about Bill C-22 and then see if we have time, we can go back to some of the employment and disability pieces or Shh. I'm open. Okay. Well, why don't I just talk a little bit about Bill C-22 right now so that if people have questions they, they want to put into um, the chat to, uh, to the, sorry, the Q&A, about that forget my own introduction there you know i'll just say i'll oh, put it in there so if it put your questions into the q a you you know we have time to read them and be prepared to answer so for those of you who aren't aware throne speech 2020 the government um proposed a benefit called the canada disability benefit as a supplement a federal supplement to to top up the provincial and territorial and federal benefits that that people receive since then we've gone on a roller coaster of legislation and um we are now almost at the end of that journey we are so tantalizingly close to it actually becoming a law that it's 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 extremely um you know um I, i'm not sleeping at nights at the moment because of it for those of you who um are aware of how a, how a bill becomes law it has been all the way through the house of commons um and there and now it's almost all the way through the senate and as of today it receives third reading in the senate 
which is the final piece. So each in each house, it has a first reading, second reading. It goes to a committee. That committee reports back and it gets a third reading. And that today is the start of that, that third reading in the Senate. Um, amendments have been proposed and without getting too technical, those amendments then have to, if they are passed today and tomorrow, in third reading in the Senate, they then go back to the House and the House has to spend two hours debating each of the five of them. And if they're accepted, the bill gets royal assent. If they're not, they get sent back to the Senate in some ugly game of ping pong. And it's the middle of May and they rise and we have a long weekend coming up and they rise for the summer on the 23rd of june and they have a lot of other business to cover like the budget and so on before then so as you can imagine five amendments two hours for each of them there's a lot of time um, that's needed to get this bill to royal assent and royal assent means it then becomes a law before the summer recess happens and that's important for so many reasons. Um, first, time. So if it doesn't achieve royal assent now, it doesn't come back until the fall, till after the throne speech. So we could be looking at October um, by the time they actually settle down to you know doing regular business again, which which is six months away. And you know that adds and that adds six months on to when people potentially start receiving a benefit on top of that as i'm sure we're all aware we have a minority government the summer is often the silly season where we don't you know what goes on politically um who knows what's going to happen come the fall whether um the current government is going to choose to go for an election at which point this gets cancelled this get this is gone, right? And if we go if we get if we go to an election before royal assent is achieved, we lose it all. And we have to hope that whichever government we start again, right? We have to go all the way through the whole process. It's a very cruel lesson in you know in, in how our parliamentary de democracy works at the moment, because we are so so close. Let's presume, let's put sort of the happy spin on this, that we do achieve royal assent. doesn't mean that people are getting money anytime soon. We then have to go through what's called regulations. And that's where is actually going to be all the stuff that we all want to know is going to be worked out. How much? To who? To who how is it being paid out? All of those sorts of things clawbacks you name it the big laundry list that we have going individualization as we talked about before you know spousal caps and so on so that does not start until royal assent is achieved those things can't coincide right and so um that means that if we don't achieve royal assent now all of that work is put off for potentially six months as well so as you know when betty and i'd had a conversation about um about you know what we were going to talk about in our conversation today and uh, i said well hey who knows what we're going to be talking about when it comes to bill c22 and as you can tell from my accent i i grew up in england and i i'm a big football fan and like soccer um manchester united and there's an old manager who's retired now from from um, from my football club Manchester United who used to call this period of the game squeaky bum time it was when you went into extra time in a game and perhaps you were drawing and you needed one more goal to get it across the line today right now we are in severe squeaky bum time for this bill because we need that royal assent like if the you know as more than anything else, because we can't get on to anything else that people need um, without uh, without moving on to royal assent. So that's my not so quick as to where we are. But the hope of it is to lift disabled people at least to the regular poverty line. 
not the amount that we you know the government does not have data on as that extra cost of disability but what a friend of mine calls that outrageously reasonable request to let people live in poverty like that's what we're saying here we're not asking you know oh, people have heard me say this a million times we're not asking for lollipops and rainbows nobody wants to live at the poverty line it's not it's not a desirable place and one dollar ten dollars over the poverty line it's still the damn poverty line and that's where we're asking for disabled people to be lifted to and you know i know there's so many of us on this call that are in this work and you know betty the work that you guys do at west coast leaf and you know i i just believe that with the 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 will of all of us together to at least at least get this one benefit off and running that the hope that when you do your next report card we can say that well okay it's still not great it's not the answer it doesn't solve housing it doesn't solve employment or education or care or any give people money so uh, yeah we are thank you um i think to you for compiling the questions. Um, I think in light of the conversation about Bill C-22, one of the first questions is like, how can we campaign and push government to increase the rates? And in light of the urgency that you just spoke of, Michelle, do you have any um, ideas here? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I talk about dignity, independence, autonomy often, and it's not, very dignified to ask or to have to tell you know, to ask for money or to have to tell the stories of how you live in poverty and, and and at dwp we've asked people and they've told us their stories because they want them to be told so the single biggest thing that you can do is tell your elected officials at all levels you know because the housing piece is often municipal right so they're not off the hook but provincially because this new benefit that we're talking about has to work with this you know new federal the provincial and federal pieces have to work together but everything else that we've talked about um everything else um has is a provincial responsibility here so reach out to your mlas reach out to ministers tell them the situation that you live in so that they have that, you know, or tell them that the people that you represent, if you're here from an organization, they, they need, you know, and as they need to hear those stories, they need to not just hear the generic, you know, um, people in these marginalized vulnerable groups need assistance. They need to hear the specifics and have things that really make sense to them. And you never know what's going to resonate with somebody somewhere, right? It's quite, it's, you know, I found that the, with the politicians that I talk to, because they're the, the change makers or the senior bureaucrats, all of a sudden they'll say, can you, can you explain that to me again? And that, that one, or they will say, oh, I have a relative or a friend of a friend of a, and that it will, it will, you know, it, it will trigger the response into them. And I have to say, it's not, something that sits well with me i believe that statistics should tell the story i believe that numbers you know but we live in a sort of a media age where where people expect that moment right they expect that viral you know and so we end up having to use these situations in ways that 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 are not are not full of you know, dignity or non-harmony, but the lives that people are living in are not full of dignity either, right? So that that's the, you know, so that's kind of that's 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 where reach out to those people who who they're not the change makers, we're the change makers, but they are the people that control when the change happens. Thank you. Um 
And then another question is on um, the exclusion of injured workers from data collection. Why is this group not included in the analysis of disability, gender, and poverty? Um, I can't really speak to this question. I'm not sure um, in what context the data is excluded. I don't know, Michelle, if you have anything to say to this, but I'm sorry to whoever asked this question. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I have to say that data collection is becoming a, a particular bugbear of mine because, you know, as you say, injured workers being missed from data collection or the people that are missed of, from data collection are people who live in institutionalized settings. So disabled people who live in long-term care or group homes and that sorts of things. Um, you know, so the data that we get to deal with is as only as, you know, there's, there's a, there's a situate that what's that G I G O garbage in garbage out. Right. Is, and, and so the data that we get to work with in these situations is only as good as the data that is collected. And, um, and so I, I really, um, um, I really think that, um, that's, you know, on the list of things that we need to push for is better data. You know, as, a, as you probably heard, one of mine is that people, um, the cost of disability isn't measured in Canada as it is in some other countries. So, you know, I think it's really important that, that, that those of us, you know, within organizations that get to have conversations with people who are able to collect data, um, and we know a lot of that is done, you know, by the governments, either provincially, federally. But, you know, there are other groups like Maytree who are able to, to collect data as well, which is excellent. Um, but that we, you know, that we can talk about the directions that that, that we need that data collection to go in. Um, so I see I, I see a couple of questions about the right fit and what about universal design of housing, um, you know, and that new, all new builds in Australia are now universal design. Yeah, I have a step through the UK and there's a lot of universal design going on there. So one of the problems we have here in BC is that um, our um, standards for for accessibility are, are not I'm, I'm sorry i get to a point where we've been to, betty knows we've been talking to a point where i start to lose the words i've look, I'm, I'm looking for our standards are not things that you have to do they're they're there by choice <laughs> um, so you can choose whether to do them or not and with the accessible british columbian act like standards are going to become requirements instead however things that are currently in place are grandfathered or grandparented into place that so they don't have to be changed so yes new builds i would hope once we get um, the standards part of the abc up and running i would hope that that would be taken care of here in bc but it's it's a concern that everything that's already out there doesn't have to be retrofitted because you know the new build portion is minimal compared to what's already out there. Um, I saw a question about criminalization of people with disabilities. I thought that was an important question and how it intersects with um, poverty. Um, for example, in Vancouver recently, there was the um, street sweeps or the removal of encampments by the police and city workers. Um, and, you know, this goes back to the point earlier about how we blame individuals for structural issues. So instead of the city working with the province or other levels of government to address poverty, to address the housing crisis, um, they go and um, remove people from what is essentially their homes. Um, and I think this criminalization or like this policing can also occur in other ways, for example, in the context of the child welfare or the family policing system, where uh, people with disabilities or parents with disabilities are more likely to have to be disproportionately the subject of the state surveillance, um, and that impacts 
their access to their children that impacts um, and, and also connected to the pathologization or like the medicalization of disability and, you know, having to go to a doctor to um, ask for signatures, but then in filling out those forms, the doctors might be, you know, potentially discussing like your worst day, um, but then what would the child welfare or family policing worker, MCFD employee be doing with that information if they have access to it, you know? Are they going to make judgments about your ability to parent? Um, so it's all interconnected and it's how we as a society approach disability and how we as a society approach poverty. Um, and uh, I think that's my point. Like that would be my um, answer to that question. I don't know, Michelle, if you No, I, I'm... A I think I think you're absolutely spot on in that we create, you know, that uh, legislated poverty also creates situations where there is no option for some people than to lean towards criminal criminal activities that, you know, that I would say is through no fault of their own. Um, and that 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 in itself in that 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 our systems created those situations. It, they didn't do it because they wanted to, um, you know, like rob a bank of gold bullion and have millions of dollars and go live a life in the sun. They did it because they needed food and rent, you know. And when we were talking, as I say the word food, when we were talking before, um, food inflation at the moment is, uh, is around 10%, right? And um, when you look at the proportion that people spend PWD and other welfare assistance payments on food takes a massive part of that, right? It's a, um, uh, and so therefore it 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 has a larger impact. So when the price of food goes up, um, you know, people's life becomes even more squeezed. So no, I think you you covered that you covered that extremely well, Betty. And it, it it's it's a part of this this no win systemic situation that people are in and that has only got worse in the last three years with the pandemic and the pressures that you know we're seeing with supply chain and war in Ukraine and all of those those other pieces that 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 are true and that are out there but the impact is is felt most harshly by our most vulnerable people and I think one of the pieces that a few people have asked us to touch on and, and we do have some time um, is is employment right employment and disability and I talked about before that um, you know that BC had moved that that um, earnings from monthly to annual but it means there's, there's two pieces to that one you have to be somebody who is is able to work at all right and many people you know with disabilities who are in poverty it's because they are never you know, they they either require an injury or a disability or they are born with a congenital disability. That means that they are never able to work. And those people deserve to have a life that is not in poverty as much as anybody who works. Right. You should not be um, you should not be have to live in poverty because something in life's lottery said that that you were not able to take part in this thing that we value and we give money for that's that's called work right so and those people are still massive um massive contributors to their society you know whether it's through being you know friends and relatives to people in their community whether it's through being able to volunteer whether it's you know being, being a contributing member of society, right? We should not just value people by their capacity to work. But when it comes to employment, um, you know, we find that there are so many barriers that are, are extremely difficult to face. So I'm dealing with one of my own right now is that my, you know, we've been going for an hour and a quarter and that's longer than I can typically talk for. And I lose my ability to speak. And I have friends who are entirely nonverbal and who are, have as many degrees as I do and things like that. 
and are not able to hold down a job. And I find that absolutely criminal because we judge we judge our ability to participate in the workforce on on measures of time right so if you're somebody who has to type your or, or use eye gaze or something to respond to somebody that takes longer and comes with a judgment than somebody who is able to and talk to each other the way Betty and I have been doing for the last hour. So there are so many for all, um, you know, access to employment, you know, the right to work. There are many excellent programs out there, but there is a fundamental piece that has to, that is attitudinal to do with people with disabilities that um, that maybe you know disability is equated to um, ill health and being untimely and a whole other you know again my brain isn't able to pull them out right now a whole other load of situations that factually just aren't true when it comes to the you know disabled people given a, a fair shake of the can in the workforce are shown to be you know responsible committed um you know as 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 great workers as anybody else can be so i think um you know the people with disabilities are typically unemployed and underemployed um we're not doing a great job, but we're certainly doing a better job at educating people with disabilities in allowing them to have better access to education in that creating, again, educational programs that are fair and equitable so that disabled people are judged on what they can do and what they can't do. I don't think our, our, our attitudinal beliefs has done the same thing to the workplace and and uh, and that um, I know that often um, when it comes to elections and so on, that the platforms often include these, we're going to, you know, get more disabled people into the workforce by, you know, the way we need to do that is, is by one, recognising that things need to change attitudinally and two, recognising that some people aren't going to ever fit the mould that, that, that people have. I'll pass over to you, Betty, because I'm croaking out. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing, Michelle. And I think we also have to maybe question the mold um, and how the structures that we have in place aren't working. A lot of people are working in precarious job situations where they don't have access to things like benefits, for example, um, paid sick leave, which um, I know the government uh, legislated that by amending the Employment Standards Act. So there's like five days of paid sick leave, but um, first, it doesn't cover everyone. Second, um, it was less than the 10 days minimum that was asked for. Um, it, it's just five days. And the idea that people's caregiving needs or people's likelihood of being sick is just only five days a year is um, ridiculous. So we need to question those structures. We need to question those molds instead of expecting people with disabilities and other people with intersecting identities or, or caregivers to fit Give this us. capitalist mold that we have, um, that we're just stuck in. Um, so I think we have to look at that as well. Um, and I think another piece here about the employment disability is the gender pay gap. Um, and BC has one of the worst gender pay gaps. I know recently there's been some work on pay equity or what post leave. My colleague, Marija Beer, and others in the coalition did some work on that area, um, advocating for pay equity. Um, and I think this is an important issue here because of um, the impact the lack of pay equity can have in the long term. You know, who is more likely going to you know, like need uh, like as as you grow older, your care needs are probably going to increase. So like not having enough money set aside for that, not having because you were paid less um, for so long, um, that's a structural barrier. 
I yeah. think that so one of the areas that we skipped over because we we couldn't you know one of the things that uh, I'll, and I'll talk about it briefly because it's another one of my I could go on because it's my it's it's my research area um, is is care and caring and and as an as a as a profession as a career is typically you know a, a woman's job and we undervalue the 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 work that's done by carers and so we end up with this situation where as you said our, our carers typically put together a patchwork of of employment opportunities um you know with multiple employers which means that they you know um are not able to build up that cap the capacity as you say to save it means that they're that benefit programs maybe there may be a partial one here but maybe they don't work enough hours to get into it so for all they may be working full what we would consider full time hours and more they they are not able to reap the benefit of being a full time employer that may, that you may get from being in a in a one place work environment and so you know then then when we look at that from the flip side that so the most of the people delivering that are women the majority of people receiving care in our long term care homes and and so on are women as well and so the whole system that whole microcosm is undervalued and overmanaged in so many ways um, that you know from the the, the 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 money that goes into the food that is prepared for people that is injurious to their health to the hours that that are not the the, the lack of carers that are available so that the hours of care are not available for those who receive it. So you have these women that are, are, are being put under immense pressure by their management because they're spending too much time with that typically woman who requires the care and needs more care than they're able to give. So, you know, as I look as we're sort of approaching um, the end of our, you know, bringing together the gendered lens from West Coast Leaf and the disability lens that, uh, you know, the, the, the reason that, that, that we joined you in this conversation. I find our care system, whether it's long term care, home care, you, you name it, where, you know, the idea that it's women that typically take time off to be the caregiver from cradle to, to grave. Um, I find that that is the microcosm that covers most of the things that we've been talking about, Betty. Um, you know, and, and that if there was if there was one place within our whole system that we could work on making massive changes, and that would make ma massive change to the lives of the most disabled people, and often the most marginalised women workers, because often the, that gendered piece comes into um, immigrant workers as as well um, who are often underemployed and you know um, it's it's in that whole microcosm of how how we view and value and deliver care in our province and our country so yeah. I just want right. to are there any any questions that we haven't covered so oh yeah shelly and uh, talks about their starting coffee with the police in new brunswick um because of understanding uh, invisible disabilities and this is something that we don't not having the success that you're talking about uh, shelly um that in Kelowna, a, a friend pointed out to me there is a notice in our local library to say in that any people that use our library must be sober and to take that apart in so many ways um you know who is the judge of who's sober and why it's just this is so and you know and it's a it's a um, a euphemism for you know our unhoused population in Kelowna and the people that are that are doing the judging is the library has has employed security guards so not social workers, not people with any expertise. And as Shelley men mentions, there's, there's, you know, people with invisible disabilities. Um, myself, I, I have MS and a lot of people with MS are often thought because we stagger and 
as you can see, our speech gets slurred and those sorts of things are thought, um, you know, to not to not be sober and so on. But even if we weren't, right, like even if we um, what you know, there's a whole load of reasons why somebody is accessing a library. So I, I really I really like the, the program that you're seeing better uptake from younger and newer officers to for coffee with the police to try and forge some understanding you know what a what a what a great way way forward um but as she said uh sorry the next part i shouldn't laugh but sometimes the province is investing millions into building a new jail to criminalize the homeless yeah our province is also building a mega long-term care facility in in uh, colwood that again and i'd need another hour for with 300 beds in it when people want to live at home with dignity so Yes, thank you, Shelley, as ever. Um, um, from the other side of the country, we have so much similar and, and so much that is different. Um, I think the only, um, I don't think there's any other question. Maybe there's um, a comment yes. about Pharmacare. I don't know that it's a question. Um, yeah, I, I think... think Sorry. I think that's something that we're, you know, here in BC, I know that we're finding that um, people are being um, pushed onto different drugs that aren't necessarily the, the original formulation and so on, and, and, and are finding um, complexities with that. And that, um, you know, I'm, I'm somebody recently diagnosed as diabetic and every new every new door right i it, it gives me a light on people's lives so first you know with people if if you're more likely to you know people with um type 2 diabetes who are not able to access a decent food supply that's another whole area that we have had no chance to cover today um but also the the um, numbers of things like the test strips that you're able to access to 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 know exactly what's going on with your blood sugar the different drugs that just aren't available and often when we talk about mental mental health it's those drugs that are that are uh, not available within our system um or, or when we talk about the opioid crisis drugs that um ag again are, uh, are not available and that push people to 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 using drugs that are often unsafe because they've got from street sources rather than pharmaceutical sources. So yeah, the, the need for uh, an open um, cost effective drug supply for people with all conditions so that it doesn't contribute to everything we've talked about today, I think is extremely important. Yes, I agree. I think it just points to how we need a holistic care system that cares for people all the way through that has uh, preventative care in it along with um, ongoing care and all the way through you know whatever medications are required it's covered um, so it's not just like bite like pieces and bites here and there but like all around cares for the whole person for the whole life um, and I think that's it I think I think we are uh, out of questions. We're out of time, out of out of energy, and uh, I appreciate the audience that we've had today. And thank you for sticking with us and asking us questions. And Betty, people, and, and so you and the, everybody at West Coast Leaf, thank you so much for inviting us at DWP to join us in this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.